everyone, welcome back. And now we continue with Raphael Erdogan with his talk, How I Learned to Love Legacy Code and Why You Should Too. And I'm not a developer, which is obvious, so enjoy. <laughs> Great. Okay, uh, so um, this talk is, is meant to be like a, a recount of my journey from being an angry developer to being this Zen guy who says, hey, love everyone. Uh, so the, my story begins uh, at university. I, after I uh, did my MSc, I actually did a PhD uh, at, one, at a bioinformatics com company. And uh, most of the uh, things we built were, were really tiny, small applications that we were done with in like two weeks. So I had the privilege of always working on a Greenfield project. And then in 2011, I joined, joined the company Marsis. Marsis is a Vienna-based company, but development is in Hungary. And uh, uh, it, it started like in 2001, and for like 10 years, they were just hacking away in, on the code. Uh, and by 2010, they had such a horrible legacy that for an entire year, MRSIS wasn't able to deploy a new version to production. Every time they tried to deploy, they have to roll back because there were so many bugs. So, so in 2010, they actually brought in two guys, two Hungarian guys, uh, who, who started to reform the company in terms of development. And, and they did a fairly good job. And I joined the company in 2011. And even though they had like a year of work behind them, uh, trying to, you know, clean up the mess they got from from the old developers. Uh, when I first uh, on my first day when I uh, had my first encounter with the code, my first reaction was, "Okay, I still have that offer from Morgan Stanley. I should just quit right now." Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so then I decided not to quit because uh, the company has a really good culture, really smart people. So I just decided to stick around and see what these really smart people are going to do with this code. And yeah, that's how, how, it, how uh, it started with the analysis. And uh, I'm not going to do any spoilers. You will see where we got with that. Uh, and then after about, about two other years, I started a hobby project, which is Lean Poker. And if you're interested, I can tell you about Dean Poker after the talk or in the questions section. Uh, but the, the important part about Dean Poker is that uh, I actually wanted to build something that people can use, and people are already using it. Uh, so so I, I was alone on a project that this was substantially big for me to to feel like I, I'm not, I will never get done, all right? So uh, at first I, I started doing really clean code there and you know beautiful, beautiful uh, architecture and all that. And then at some point I realized that if I want to get done, I'm gonna I'm gonna take some some, uh, some shortcuts. And that taught me a lot about uh, about why uh, legacy code is around. So so basically that's that's the reason these these two things that the company and this project project that that changed my view on legacy code. But before I go into more detail, let's just uh, talk about what legacy code. Can someone give me a definition for legacy code? Anyone? Okay, all right. Look at two. One is code without tests, and the other one is... Yeah, code without tests, that's uh, Michael Federer's definition. And the second one is uh, legacy code is that which you would do totally different. Okay, that's that's also a nice one. Something you would do com completely different if you would do it now. And the, uh, the first definition is really nice, but my problem with uh, that definition that it's code without test is that I have seen horrible legacy code that has test. And and what's even worse than having a code without test is having code with tests that are horrible and legacy code themselves. So uh, that's that's not that doesn't really work for me. Uh, although Michael Federer's book is amazing, and you should read it if you haven't. Uh, the other definition I like more, but my definition for today is going to be the reaction you have. Okay, so when, when, when you see code and you go, oh my god, no, that's legacy code, okay? <laughs> uh, so, 
So any girl that you you instantly feel like you are you, going going to hate when you see it. Uh, now why why why, you, why we should love it? And uh, here's the cliche. And I really don't like this cliche because I think it's uh, shallow and stupid. But the cliche is this girl pays your salary, so be happy about it. <laughs> no, I'm not happy about it. All right. I I know it's going to pay pay my salary. But the thing is, I still get to hate the sucker who did that code, okay? <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I don't mind if he pays my salary, I still get to uh, hate people who, who wrote that code. So, let's see, let's see how we how can have a different uh, perspective. Uh, why, do we have, why do we have a legacy code to begin with? That's the first, first question I want to address. Is it because of incompetence? Is it because uh, every single time there's a project, there will be someone who is incompetent. Or maybe, maybe it's just that uh, new companies, new startups, don't, don't, cannot allow themselves to hire really good people at the beginning. Well, that, that can be a part of it. And uh, I don't say it's not a part of it. But I think it's, it's, it's like, so if I put myself in the shoes of the company owner, Am I going to trust my project on incompetent people? Certainly not. So probably every every company owner is trying to do their best to avoid incompetence. So fighting incompetence is not going to get us less legacy like code. How about pressure? Of course, everyone had the had the boss who just came around and said, "Hey, I need this uh, for tomorrow," and you say, "All right, but it takes one week." No, I need it for tomorrow. Well. Then you have to somehow solve the situation, so maybe you are going to hack. Okay, that's fine. Um, but so one of the things I do hear here a lot of times is that they don't let us do it right, and that actually happens at some companies. What I what my advice to you is that if you are the company where they don't like you do things right, try to find another job. Seriously. There are a lot of jobs around, uh, so so really it's, it's on you. It's on you as a developer to push back on the pressure because the job of your manager is to make sure that he gets the most out of his money. All right, so he's going going to put pressure on you because that's his job, and your job is to push back on that pressure and reach this equilibrium where you have enough uh, time. Uh, yet, so it's 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 like you have to try to push back, and as long as you, as you as you have a nice balance, that's fine. If you don't have nice balance, then it's probably not not gonna work for that company. Okay, so how about not caring enough? You everyone had the had colleagues who uh, just sat around and didn't do much, or or they just didn't care and uh, hacked it, hacked that thing again. And yeah, there are some people like that. If you're a company owner, get rid of them. <laughs> uh, but but I don't think that's that's regular. And I think neither of these things are the real reason. I think that these uh, these things come from the comfort zone. It's really really comforting to think that everyone else is uh, is the the reason for uh, the legacy code. It's not us. It's always others. And I think that's, that's coming from the comfort zone. And probably this conference is one of the best ways to be in the comfort zone because you have like all of these developers here and you get to talk about your stupid bosses and your stupid colleagues and you get to do this backpatting exercise. Okay, I understand, I understand you. Don't cry. It's fine. So don't do that. Let's, let's move on to the comfort zone. And, and ask some ask us one very uncomfortable question. Does that code hurt? And I actually want you to uh, put your hands up. So, uh, who thinks that bad code can hurt the company? Most of you, very nice. Now, uh, who thinks that it can hurt so bad that the company can go bankrupt because of that? Okay. Is there anyone who maybe thinks that bad code is actually an advantage? 
<laughs> okay, now I have a question for you. Uh, there, is, there is this guy, uh, Darwin, who came up with evolution, right? And what he says is that always the fittest will survive in evolution. And I think that's really similar with companies. Uh, companies should be really fit to survive against competitors. So, if bad code can hurt companies, how come most successful companies have horrible legacy code? And millions of lines of legacy code. How is it that we have all these companies and maybe legacy code is just the key to success? Is it possible? Now that's a really interesting question. And uh, a few months ago, I heard a really interesting talk about <coughs> evolution and, sorry, I think I just managed, okay, so uh, the talk was about evolution uh, and about traits that seem disadvantages. So one of these examples is peacocks. They have these huge feathers, right? Everyone loves peacocks for their huge feathers. But here's the deal, peacocks cannot fly far. They can fly like five meters and they have to stop. Because they have these huge feathers, they cannot really fly. And that's a really big disadvantage for them because they get caught by predators pretty easily. So why do they have these big feathers? And the answer to that is that they have these big feathers because peahens actually like big feathers. They, they won't mate with a peacock with smaller feathers. They just want to ha have the big feathers. Okay, okay, then why do bee hands prefer big feathers? Because obviously it, it's a disadvantage for uh, the peacock to have big feathers, so they wouldn't ha want to have kids with big feathers if that would be true. Uh, and it turns out that way back in history, peacocks had a really small feathers, like none, almost none. And that was the disadvantage for them. They had so small feathers that they got caught and stuff like that. So at some point in, in the past, peahens were selected out, uh, those peahens were selected out that preferred larger feathers. And then they had this runaway selection. And that happens sometimes in uh, nature. It actually can lead to a so-called evolutionary suicide, where a piece of species evolves a feature because of this runaway selection that is so disadvantageous that they die out. That can happen. So, <clears throat> so actually we still have peacocks, but it's a really interesting story. So then let's, let's think about companies. What could be the, the advantage of of uh, legacy code. And for that, I would like to uh, mention Martin Fowler's design statement hypothesis. And this is, this is like pseudoscience. I will have charts, but they are not real data. These are just gut feelings uh, illustrated, all right? So first chart. <laughs> so on this chart, I have time as the x-axis and number of features we have on the y-axis. And as we follow along, uh, we are, as, as time passes, we will have more and more features, right? So the hypothesis is that if you do really good design, then in the long term, you will have more features. But in the short term, hacking away is just better. It just gets you a bit, of, bit more ahead if you start by hacking. And there is a very important line, line here called the design payoff line. Design payoff line is the point where design actually pays off. Yeah, that's, that's like obvious. So the question is really how big is your project? If your project is small, then maybe just hacking away is better. If your project is big, then, then uh, you should do good design. So the really interesting question is where is the design payoff line? Is it in uh, weeks? Is it in months? Maybe is it in two years? And that's a really good question. And what I think, on based on my own experience, and this is completely in my own experience, and you might disagree, but it depends on the project. It really, really strongly depends on the project. In a front-end project, you can do away without design for a year. 
if you have a, a calculation heavy project where you where making a mistake can cost people's lives, then it's a day. You cannot do away with that good design if, you, if, if people's lives are at stake. So there is this continuum, right? There are projects that where the design pay offline is, is like in a, a day or two. And there are projects where it's years and there are a lot of projects in the middle. Now let's draw another curve on this same chart and that's the risk curve. So when, when we start a project we have no idea, we, we have an idea, right? It all starts with one brilliant mind coming up with the next Facebook, right? So it turns out that most of the next Facebooks are really scrappy ideas and there is only one Facebook. Uh, <clears throat> so at the beginning I have a really high risk that maybe my idea is just not going to cut it. Okay? And as we go along in time and implement new and new features and test it on actual users, this risk is going to plummet. And after a while we've had, we will have a really small risk. But how, ri how big this risk can be? A few years back there was a survey where they actually looked at different features of uh, a product. And what they found was that 45% of the features were never used. No single user ever used them. And it wasn't because they didn't advertise those features. They actually tried to get people to use them, but they didn't need those features. And then there was 19% where it was rarely used. That means two-thirds of the work developers done at that company was waste. They could have spent two-thirds of their time on the beach and it would have been more useful. Okay? So this is not a small risk. This is a huge risk. And because of that, uh, there is a guy called Eric Rice who came up with Lean Startup. I really think that you should read his book. It's an amazing book. Uh, Eric Rice, The Lean Startup. And in that book, he uh, basically, this is the most important thing in the book, minimum viable product. Minimum viable product is the smallest set of features you can do to test your uh, hypothesis that this is a good idea. Okay, so I have an idea. It's a hypothesis that it's a good idea. Maybe it's a bad idea, maybe it's a good one. I want to test if it's a good or a bad idea. What is the smallest number of features I can implement to do that test? And that's the minimum viable product. And maybe, maybe you don't, don't have to write a single line of code. That's perfectly possible. There are uh, ideas you can test without actually writing code. But if you do have to, then you want to write the minimum amount of code. And here is the big question. How does this relate to the design payoff line? Because if the, design, if the minimum buy product feature set is above this design payoff line, there is no question. You have to do good design, right? Up front, from the first minute, first minute you're going to do good design if the design payoff line is below the minimum buy product. But I drew, drew it the other way around, because most of the time, this is the situation, most of the time your minimum buy product will be way below the design payoff line. Way below. And the thing is, the, this red area here, right, right up until your first release, depending on if you did good design or hacking. Uh, what you see here is that this is your uncertainty. This is how much time you are spending in uncertainty. You don't know if the thing you are working on is worth a single penny. You don't know if the thing you are spending your money on, your actual money, that is in your pocket or used to be, is going into something that's worth doing or not. And that's, that's a really important thing. So that looks like a trap, right? Because if most of the time the minimum viable product is below the design payoff line, and as a responsible uh, guy, I'm gonna uh, do the hacking way because, because you know, I, I, I really don't want to spend more money than I, than I really have to, then we will always end up with legacy applications. But the thing is that this, these are only two extremes that you can have. You have a lot of other curves. And one of the curves is just hacking away to the first release, seeing if it works fine, 
seeing if if uh, you can go to market with it and and if it work, and then you start doing the design, and you can actually actually move to that other curve, and basically that's that's what happened to MRCs as well, that they 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 didn't stop hacking at the new web project. They actually went further, a lot further on that curve, but we actually managed to to move back to good design, and by now. I don't say that we don't have legacy code, but it's a hell of a lot better than it used to be. And it's actually pretty, pretty comfortable to work with, with by now. But that's not even the thing that usually happens. The thing that usually happens is this. You start off, you create a minimum viable product, and it turns out that, ah, yeah, it's a good idea, but not like this. We actually have to delete most of the code. We have a small core feature set that we are going to keep and then we will create another minimum web product. And at that point, you do another test, and it turns out that, yeah, this is not that bad as before, but uh, you know, we still need to remove some features and do another set of uh, features for the minimum web product. And then again, you iterate a few times. Sometimes you delete more, sometimes you delete less. But in the end, you, will, you, you may reach the point where you see, OK, this is the product that we are looking for. This is what we are going to have in the future, and then you can start with doing the design and, <clears throat> and actually avoid uh, having a huge legacy bef uh, for too long. But the thing is that like nine out of 10 companies fail. So even if you do this nice iteration, you may fail. You may end up with an idea that turns out not to be good and you have spent money, and you have spent time. And in the end, when you decide to close up the company and you decide to not continue, you will have two kinds of debt. Uh, one is monetary debt, actual money you have to spend, and technical debt. Now the interesting part about monetary debt is no matter if your idea was good or bad, you have to pay that. That money is gone, it's burnt. Uh, with technical debt, it's completely different. Because if your idea is successful, you still have to pay them back. But if your idea failed, paying back the technical debt is just delete. And it's gone. You don't have that technical debt. If you decided that this company is uh, stupid, then you just delete the code and it's gone. So clean code. Clean code is really important. Because it's an amazing tool to create maintainable code. But what matters at the end of the day is can you maintain your code? Can, is, it, is it flexible enough for you to build up on it? Um, 10,000 lines of legacy, really crappy code, is easily maintainable. Where you have a problem is when you have a 1 million lines of this crap. That's a different story. But 10,000 lines, it's pretty easily maintainable. Yeah, so that, when, when, I, when actually I, I thought of that, I realized that I can respect legacy. I can respect it because this thing, this horrendous mess, was the thing that made this company successful at the beginning. It's not making successful with us now, but it used to be an advantage for the company to hack away in the beginning. The trick is that you don't want to become a peacock. <laughs> and you don't want to be, uh, become extinct because, you know, you have been growing your feathers for too long. Okay? So, so what's important is that you're making conscious trade-offs. If, you if you're not making conscious trade-offs, you are just hacking because you don't know better, then you are going to get in trouble. Maybe in three years, maybe in ten years, but you are going to get in trouble. If you are making conscious trade off, if you are saying, okay, this part is not as important, but I want to test it as soon as possible, and I'm going to take these shortcuts so that I can test it earlier, that's, that's okay. That's fine. You are making a conscious decision. Um, but if you are just hacking, that's, that's not okay. Uh, and I lost the focus again. So, what you should always think about is what's the consequence of failure? What if, what if I didn't write a test for this 
and it fails. What if, uh, what if I, I take my time and write clean code here, and after I'm done, it turns out that this is not this is not a feature that should have been built. You have to, you know, balance between doing the things cleanly and right, and between getting it done a bit quicker just to have an earlier test. But I said that I respected the code at this point, but respect is not love. It's not that yet love. So how do I come to lo love the code? And that's a different story. After I realized all that, I started to look at uh, Linux code like street dogs. Okay, so what, what's, what's with street dogs? They are filthy, they are smelly, and they might bite you. But if you love them enough, for enough, long enough, then they become this adorable little puppy. <laughs> okay? And puppies are a really good uh, way to engage your audience. So. <laughs> Uh, so what you should try to do is see the potential in the code that you are working with. If it's a legacy code, try to see where you could, where you could, uh, what you could turn it into. Okay. Uh, but for that, you actually need patience and a lot more patience than what you need with dogs, because you can uh, train a dog in half a year. For legacy code, it will take you years. So another metaphor I think is really useful here is that of large cities. So imagine that you have just become the next mayor of Gotham. And you know, Gotham is a big city, a lot of bad ports. There are some nice buildings, but most of it is just crappy. So what do you do? How do you clean up Gotham? Well, not by bombing it, the whole city and demolishing it all together and then building new buildings. That's not the way you treat a, an old city. Actually, I realized that uh, it would be a much better way if I talked about Vienna. So, uh, you have Vienna, you are the mayor of Vienna. <laughs> you have this nice uh, city center, you have the Schönbrunn and, and uh, Burghof. You don't want to bomb that, right? Because they are beautiful. So how do you fix a uh, city? First of all, you can build new modern blocks. You know, on the outskirts of the city, that's fine. And what I mean by that, you can uh, build microservices that just uh, get linked up with your legacy code base. So what happened with Amorsis is that we have this huge legacy and we started pulling out the services. They are not really microservices, more like feature services and, and some microservices as well. But, but the idea is that when you are doing a new feature, then you are not going to hack it into the existing legacy code base. You are going to create a microservice and just wire it up with the legacy code base. And with that, you can slowly start building up this little happiness islands where you really like to work because it's a greenfield project. That's one thing you can do. Next thing you can do is, you know, some buildings just need refurbishing, okay? So it's a little old but you can, you can still fix it. And that's, that's a metaphor for a, a part of the code where you just have to do little changes. And, and you don't have to take, uh, make big changes there, just little changes. And you try to make it a little, be little better. But one thing you should remember is that when you have a building from the 19th uh, century, then probably you are not going to go to uh, um, craftsmen to create you 19th century tools to refurbish your home, right? You are going to practical and buy the new tools. And, and that's my advice, is to not try to fix that old crappy code with the same methods that it, was been, it has been created with. Be brave and use the, use the new tools, new, uh, new possibilities, and, and that will help you to to have a better experience there. Okay, and then sometimes you just want to replace a certain building. And yeah, that sometimes it comes. Sometimes there is a point where this building just doesn't, uh, you can't refurbish it because it's in too bad condition, but you don't want to change the cityscape, right? So what a lot of times happens is that they, 
build houses like this. It's uh, an architecture, architecture style called facadism, where you just uh, demolish the building from the inside, but you keep the outside and build another building inside the walls. And, and that's actually something you can do with legacy code. You pick a module, you say, okay, this module is, is really crappy, so I'm going to replace it. And what you can do is you can build another module with the same interface. And yeah, first, first of all, you, we usually build uh, an interface run. So sometimes you have to cut off a nice interface, but a lot of times it's already there. So then you can build another, another uh, code base with the same features and, and the same interface, and then you can just swap it out. But the trick is that you are not going to spend months and months and months building this new module. What you are going to do is <clears throat> two things. First of all, you choose a really small module. Never choose a big one. Choose one that you think you can, you can rewrite in like two or three weeks. You will end up working on it for four months. <laughs> That's actually experience. But if you, if you choose something you think you can rewrite in two or three weeks, then you can be done with it in four months. And, and sometimes you can get uh, management approval for that. Um, and and what, one, of the, one of the stories I have for this one is there was this module called import in our system. And the problem was that at some point, the daily imports of one customer uh, took 25 hours. Now you can actually think about it, this if it, it takes 25 hours to do the daily import, it's not going to work, right? <laughs> so we have to do something. And what we did was this. We already had continuous deployment, which is really cool. So what we did was here, here we had this large module. And we built in a router at the bottom. And the router had one task. It had to decide, is this uh, request supported by the new version? If it was supported by the new version, we routed the request to the new version, and the new version did the job. If it wasn't, then we routed it to the old version. And this is what we did. We first created the most frequently used feature, built that into the new version, and did dark launch, which means that we ran the same process with both versions. And once we, ha we had both versions running, we could compare the results. And after that, when we were confident that this new version is fine, we just started using the new version and not running the old version. Then we added the new feature. And at this point, depending on which features are in the request, uh, you would sometimes run the new version, sometimes run both and compare, and sometimes run the old version. And gradually, you can uh, feature by feature move over to the new version. And that's really cool because every step of the way, you can already uh, make sure that your new version works exactly like the old version. And it's quicker. Sorry? And it's also quicker. And it's also quicker. And you can measure how, how much more quicker. But I will talk yeah, about so that. Uh, <clears throat> so the other thing is that, mm, yeah, so you also have the option to, to just stop at some point. Or, it, or you go through with it and with the old version. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say, okay, I forget, but we get back to that. Uh, so, so this is this is like a really exciting challenge to find the right solution. Do I want to build a new service? Do I want to refurbish this module, or am I going to replace it? This is like a really exciting and hard decision. And making that decision is, is one of the in, most impre interesting parts of my job right now. The other thing is continuous deployment is really helpful for this process. If you have continuous deployment, you can slowly and gradually move to uh, the new version uh, by making sure that you're not breaking anything. And I just remember what I, I wanted to say. So uh, the other thing that might happen is that there are differences between the old and new version. And you look at the logs, and it turns out that your version is good, and the old version is, uh, has actually had a bug. And that's a really nice moment, because then you realize, I just fixed the bug that no one knew about. <laughs> <laughs>
And well, one story that I had was when I found the bug that was around <coughs> from 2003, and I found it in 2012, and no one ever realized that it wasn't working. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it wasn't a uh, frequently used feature. Actually, actually, I think that no one uses it because otherwise they would have realized. Anyway, uh, so this can be rewarding. This, this can be a, a really rewarding process. And to close off this talk, I'm going to take some quotes from my teammates. This is actually quotes from my teammates, and I think that shows how rewarding this process can be. And this, this rewarding process is what makes me love Le legacy code. I don't like legacy code. No one likes legacy code. But I like the process of fixing legacy code. So, some quotes. Uh, there was this uh, feature that, we, that was requested about two years ago. And when we started working on it, we spent a week and then said to the product managers, oh, okay, we need another three weeks to finish this. And then he said, okay, just forget it. We don't need this feature then. And then a year later, he asked again, can I have this feature? Actually, it was a different product manager because that product manager was replaced. Uh, so, this, so this new product manager again come to me, came to me and said, I need this feature. And I said, ah, well, you know, last time it didn't work out really well. And he said, hmm, that's interesting. Can you look at it again? And I said, well, okay, let's look at it, but don't have high expectations. And then we just sat down, in four, and in four hours we were done. And the reason is that we have done so many things for the code to make it better, that this time it was just a single new class, and one point where we had to just include that class, integrate it. Which is amazing, I mean, wow, that's really good. We have just created something that we couldn't do a year ago. Another one. Uh, this is actually about the import feature I, I talked about before. We actually spent four months working on that import feature. Uh, we thought we would be done in three weeks. That turned out to be false. But every day it was a little faster. Every day at least some of the requests were faster. Every day we had a better experience for our customers. And by the end, it was 10 times, 10,000 times faster. That's like a huge improvement. And that 10,000 times makes it worse to work on that. What does it mean, minutes or, or seconds? No, at times. So, yeah, yeah. No, so 25 hours, it's instantaneous. It? It's almost instantaneous, yes. <laughs> So that's, that's why it's worth working on that, right? Then the next story. Uh, the new version of this module works correctly, and we could also calculate how much the bug in the old version cost the company. So the story behind this is that there was this scheduling uh, algorithm that every, every uh, autumn and spring would fail on one certain day. Right? DST. We love DST. Every developer loves DST. Uh, so, so actually, we wanted to fix that bug, and every time we want, we tried to fix it, we broke it some in some other way. So, at some point, I said, "Okay, guys, this code just just doesn't support this uh, concept of, of time zones and uh, properly. So, let's rewrite it." And we spent two weeks rewriting it, and then we dark launched this. So, dark launch is uh, when you have the old version and new version running and you compare the results. And what we did was to log the difference every time. And we actually used the new version because we knew the old version was really buggy. And, and then we went through uh, each log line one by one. Uh, is the old version correct or the old version? And every time the new version was correct, the old version uh, was buggy. So we were, first thing, we were really happy that we are so awesome that we could write a bugless feature that others couldn't, right? But the other thing is that I actually had logs of, of the mistakes the old version did. So I could say, all right, this is how much this cost the company so far. And it was a pretty big figure. And managers love this. They love when you could put them a, give them a figure, this is how much it cost us. 
and then they go like, ah, oh, we saved that money. Awesome, guys. So that's, that's really good, and that makes your managers happy, and, manager, and it, sh it should. <laughs> so, so that's a way to, to actually convince your managers that you are a uh, good guy. Okay, and then another thing. Uh, yeah, so there was this guy who joined the company about a year ago. And uh, he's working on uh, you know, my team. And uh, that part of the code, well, it was really hard to understand at that time. And he said that it took him three months to feel like he understands this, this system, even though I try, did try to do my best to explain it. Uh, yeah, and then a year later, another guy joins the company. And by that time, we have refactored so many things that uh, when we had to explain the system to this new guy, it took us four hours. It became so much clearer that it just took four hours to explain the whole thing that it used to take three months to understand. That's really good again. And finally, my favorite story. So there was this uh, manager at the company who wanted to do uh, years end uh, articles, you know, like an in inside, inside the newsletter to other uh, employees of the company. And he just wanted some numbers. And he asked me how many lines of code did you write this year. Uh, my first reaction was, are you stupid? That's a really stupid metric uh, about codes, right? So uh, the only thing lines of code measures is how much legacy you have, OK? <laughs> uh, so, so I said, OK, this is a really stupid metric. But he said, yeah, but you know, it's just, just this newsletter. It's not like I'm going to measure you on this guy. Uh, OK, and so I said, OK, if it's just for, for the newsletter, let's, let's just see it. Challenge accepted. And then uh, a few hours later, I got back to him and said, hey, man, uh, last year we had 1.8 million lines of code. Now we have 1.1. So it amounts to minus 700,000 lines. <laughs> Can you put that into your newsletter? And he was like, ah, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound good. And, and you know, the thing is, we had like tons of, tons of new features really tons of new features. And the larger feature set was actually done in less slides. How is that even possible? So I really got uh, thinking that, wow, this something amazing is going on here, so I'm going to dig deeper. And what I did was to plot uh, the amount of so the line, lines of code after each commit over the year. And this is what I saw. I saw a, a curve that was going up and up and up really slowly. And then sometimes there was a steep uh, downwards. Like in single comment, a lot of things disappear. And it happened like, like this. And the overall curve was going down, but uh, on a small scale, it was going up. And then I was like, ah, oh, that's really interesting. So there was what, this one comment, almost a million lines deleted in a single comment. I wanted to look at that. And uh, I actually look at, looked at it and it turned out that one of the guys had deleted an entire module, a huge module that wasn't used anymore because they replaced it with a lot no smaller code. And then this huge delete was there. And I actually went, went to the guy and said, hey, congratulations. You are the guy who deleted the most code this year. <laughs> and then he said, hmm, that's interesting. Where, where did I get so much code? And I told him that this, this comment. And he was like, yeah, I couldn't see it for a week after that. <laughs> he was so nervous that maybe he did something that he shouldn't have, that he couldn't see for a week. So, <laughs> but that's, that's like really good, right? Less code. We always love less code. So, <laughs> so to close off, Always look for the small wins. Try to, to make your code a little better. Every day, just a little, little better. And sometimes when these little changes add up to something bigger, when you realize that, hey, this code used to be a lot more horrible a year ago, then celebrate. Go out for a drink with your colleagues and say, hey, we did it. And that's, that's going to make you love legacy code. Nothing else. See it as a challenge and not as a burden. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, so any questions? What is MRSIS? What is MRSIS? Okay, so MRSIS is e-marketing systems. That is that, but that's what, how it started. And it's basically a B2C marketing platform. Uh, we, so it started with sending emails. But by now we send push notifications, SMS, stuff like that. Uh, we are actually sending billions of emails each month. Uh, and uh, the really important stuff about Mars is that we are not going to, we are, our aim is not to spam people. And we actually have really smart tools within our system for marketers to target a very small audience that is actually interested in, their, uh, in, their, uh, in the things they want to say. So we have prediction, we have uh, business intelligence built into the system. So you can be very specific about how, who you are going to address and you can make sure that your emails are not going to end up in, in the spam folder. Thanks. Yep. Out of curiosity, what is at your company the opinion about unit tests? Because you took it out of the equation of, of legacy code. Yeah, the thing is that uh, by default, you should write unit tests. We are taking TDD really seriously. Uh, if you want to not do TDD for a certain task, you have to have a really good reason for that. We do accept it if, if there is a really good reason then you, you, you are allowed to diverge from that, but the default is that you should write the uh, uh, test, you should do TDD, and like 99% of the time we do. So for prototypes, for example? Yeah, prototypes and, and like, like minimum by product. So it, if, if we, we have a new feature that we are not sure if it's going to be necessary, then we sometimes do hack it together and put it out and then see if, if people are interested. But the rule is that once people uh, prove that they are interested then we just rewrite it or, or just uh, stabilize it by writing tests afterwards. Okay. Any other question? Do you want to tell us something about your poker or lean poker? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking. That's an amazing question. So, <laughs> <laughs> Not like I already put that in your mouth. But <laughs> so, uh, the lean poker is this. Uh, what? Yeah, I actually have to set up Wi-Fi. So, Leap Walker is basically this. Uh, there is a one day long event where you get to write poker robots, but unlike in other events where you, um, where you write, write the robot and then after eight hours they uh, play against each other, at Leap Walker what happens is that before you start writing the code, they are already playing. And every few seconds, like clockwork, there is game. And either you win or lose. Or win or lose. And either you get ahead of other teams or you fall behind. And but but the trick is is that there is a continuous deployment set up for every team. And and you can deploy, deploy, deploy like crazy. Okay. I still don't have uh, internet, maybe if I try again. No. Uh Seth, I want to show it. Ah, finally. So, uh, so it looks like is every few seconds there is an entire tango. The winner gets five points. The second, the the people person cup game second gets three, and then you collect these points and deploy like crazy all day long, and it's still not working. Okay, yeah, maybe it's time. Nah. Okay, so the internet is really slow, so I have to skip up, skip that part. But yeah, that's 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 how, that's what it is. <laughs> maybe maybe I have it here. Ah, just a second. I actually found a tab where I have it. Yeah, so that's how it looks like. And uh, you can actually see the chart, the performance chart of different teams. And if I just go back a little, so that is, yeah, the resolution is pretty slow, uh, small, here, but you can actually see how the different teams are performing and these black dots are the deployment. And you just have to push to uh, GitHub and it deploys to Heroku automatically. It's really exciting. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I may organize one in VM soon, so 
Thank you. <laughs> but is it now a rounding program or is it an old version? Sorry? Is it now a rounding program you are showing us or is it a, a slide? That, that's actually uh, the one of the newest events. So, or oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is this is a uh, this is something I've been working for two years on. So, okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then thank you for your atten attention. And uh, if you have any other questions, then you can catch me outside.